Good morning, Saints. Once again, on this Sunday, we come to you here uh, from Assembly Chapel in Cascade, Virginia, uh, thanking you for tuning in on this Sunday morning as we continue in our series, Being Childish, Being Childlike, excuse me, Being Childlike, but Not Childish. We're going to go back to the book of Mark, chapter number 10. I'm going to begin my reading at verse number 23, and I'll conclude on today at verse number 27. Uh, as recorded in the Bible, uh, we're so glad to have my sisters and niece and nephew here uh, with us on today. So if you hear people worshiping in the background, uh, we are uh, less than 10 people, so we are still in compliance, amen, with the laws here in uh, Virginia. Uh, verse number 23 reads, And Jesus looked round about and said unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure and saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And 27, Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Uh, let us do our sermonic prayer. Father, please bless the preacher and the preaching of your word. Bless me to hear, do, and grow in Christ as a result of receiving your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, we're coming uh, from the book of Mark as our topic is to be childlike but not childish. Uh, I think for today, if I was to use a subtopic, I want to encourage everyone that everything that you set to do in God is possible to accomplish. I think I want to go back uh, from last week and one of the most important things that we covered on last week was the fact that the rich man had to sell all of his possessions. And when the rich man had to sell all of his possessions, he became sad. And, and the Bible said that Jesus told him to take up your cross and follow me. And I think what I want to go over again on this week, as I think is intricately important, is that we uh, sacrifice things for Christ. And I think I asked the question, what are you prepared to sacrifice in your own personal life? Things that are connected to your flesh, things that, that you enjoy doing, people that you enjoy being around. What is it in your life that is interfering with your relationship with God. If you remember um, the first part of the series, we talked about how the children came to God freely. They didn't let anything interrupt uh, their being in the presence of God. And that's where the saints need to be on today. We need to remove everything out of our lives to get closer to Christ. What is your cross? I told you on last week, the cross is the things that you have to sacrifice. Jesus told uh, the rich young man, there are some things that you're going to have to sacrifice, some things that are very close and dear to you that you're going to have to sacrifice. That's what Christ meant when he said, pick up your cross and follow me. Sacrifice the things that are interrupting your relationship, interrupting you getting close to me is what Jesus is saying. He understood uh, uh, the prestige that the rich young man held and, and the regards that he held his possessions in. And the Bible says that he had many possessions, but I need to tell someone here uh, in the beginning, I need to tell someone here in the introductory phase of the sermon that it doesn't matter how close it is to you, if it's moving you away from God, then, then it's a negative, it's a bad thing, it's a liability, it's not an asset. So you need to do some 
searching. You need to do some inventory and you need to see what exactly is it in my life right now. If it was a it was a matter of heaven or hell right now, what is it that would keep me from inheriting the kingdom of God? What do I need to remove from my life? Who do I need to cut off? Who, what places do I need to stop going to in order for me to inherit the kingdom of God? You see, that's one thing that the saints are not taking serious enough. We think, uh, we thought before the pandemic, as long as I go to church, everything is going to be all right. But where do you stand now that you can't come to church? You see, that has been removed from the equation. So now it's just you and God sitting in the room all alone. Like the songwriter said, it's just you and God. And now you don't have the church to, to, to go to. You don't have the congregation and the flock to be around. So now you're in isolation with God. So now it's a good time, as I've been saying for the last month and a half. Now is a good time. We're in prime time right now to see where we stand with God. You can't use church for an excuse. You can't use church uh, to, to uh, put in your, your rank on how good you are or how holy you are. Church can't judge how close you are to God now because we can't come to the physical building. But like we always say, this goes out for the folk who didn't like to come to the building anyway. You're always talking about churches in your heart. Well, yeah, churches in your heart. So what type of church are you having right now, Sister Cusella once said, if the whole church was just like you, what type of church would it be? Well, now you know what type of church it would be. Is it the type of church that lay in bed and watch Facebook on Sunday morning? Is it the type of church that's not tuning in to your local services anyway? What type Is it the type of church that instead of going to service at 11 o'clock, you're on the telephone talking about people and scandalizing their names? What type of church is it now that the church is in your heart? And God already knows what's in your heart from the beginning. I ask you to question out there in Facebook land. I ask you to question out there on social media outlets everywhere, on the internet. I ask you the question, what type of church is it now? So we look here at the Bible in Mark chapter 10. And I, I'm about to get out of here. But we look at the Bible in Mark chapter 10, verse 23. And if you don't mind, I, I would like to go verse by verse because I would like to make some observations. It's only a few verses. I want to take a few minutes of your time. But I want to make uh, some observations. And, and, and you're the only one. And I'm, 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 I'm speaking spiritually. I'm, I'm talking as being a Christian. You are the only one that can determine if you are being childlike or childish. I, I can't sit here and pass judgment, but you are the only one that can tell uh, what side of the border uh, that you're on. I, I pray that you are approaching God in a childlike manner and not in a childish manner manners. But we look here at verse 23, and the Bible says Jesus looked around about uh, at his disciples, and he asked, and this is after the rich man left uh, sad. You see, he came to God boastful. He came to God kind of on a, a cocky note, if, if, if you would allow me to use uh, my, my, my uh, if you would allow me uh, to use, uh, I can't think of the word, my imagination. <laughs> If you would allow me to use my imagination, uh, the rich man, he came in uh, boastful and, and puffed up, but he left the presence of God uh, humiliated. And that's the place that we need to be when we approach God. You need to be uh, in a humble state of mind when you approach God. You know, you need to humble yourselves under his mighty hand. So, so after this has taken place, uh, Jesus looked around and about and he said unto the disciples, you know, how hard uh, shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Jesus asked the disciples a question and there's something that I have never been able to fully understand about the disciples. I don't understand how they walked uh, with Jesus. I don't understand how they witnessed his miracles. I don't understand how they were there, uh, amen, when he made the blind to see. They were there when he made the deaf to hear. They were there when he caused the lame to be able to walk. 
but they still doubted his powers. I, I've never been able to understand that about the disciples because I think if I was there firsthand, amen, speaking about faith, you see, we, we live, we walk by faith and not by sight. The disciples saw everything that is causing us to have faith in Jesus just by reading his word. But the Bible says he asked them, you know, how hard is it? For a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And the disciples uh, were, they were astonished. The disciples, they were set back. And I'm going to tell you why in just a brief moment. But the disciples were set back. The Bible even says that they were astonished at his words. And Jesus, he wasn't deterred. Jesus wasn't sidetracked. Jesus was focused. I, I wish many of us had the focus, amen, that Jesus had when dealing with his disciples, because I can guarantee you right now, somebody has wandered off in their living room, their, their little, their, their, their mentality, their imagination is all over the place, all over the world right now, instead of being able to focus on the word of God. And I know that I'm telling the truth because sometimes when we're uh, congregated here together, I can look out the congregation and I can see people just drifting off. So I know good and well that uh, right now uh, in your living room, somebody's drifting off. Well, give me just about uh, 20 more minutes, amen, and I must bid you a farewell. I want you to focus. You see, Jesus was focused. Many of us, amen, when, when we ask a question and don't get the answer, we try to figure things out ourselves. But look how adamant Jesus is to make this point to the disciples. I don't know who I'm talking to right now uh, over the internet, but Jesus is focusing in on your problem. I'm talking prophetically just for a few moments because I hear the Holy Ghost speaking to me in my ear. You need to gather it in. You need to narrow it in. Stop Stop going here and there. Stop being spread abroad. Jesus is focusing in. Jesus is zeroing in on your situation. And, and what you need to do is focus in with him. Amen. You need to partnership with God. You need to be in partnership with Jesus. And there's great benefits of being a partner with God. Maybe I'll talk about that uh, perhaps at another place at another time. But Jesus is focused on making this point to the disciples. Jesus is focused on making his point to you and I right now at this juncture in our lives. That's why That's why we're still on stay-at-home order. That's why it's as bad as the president wants to get the, the country back into to full flow. Uh, God has the final say-so, and that's why we're still in isolation, because when we're in isolation, when we're in our homes, uh, God can gather our attention a little better. So see what it is. God is trying to speak to you right there in your home. He tells the disciples, he says, after they were astonished at his words, the Bible says that, that Jesus answered again. He answered again. It, it's something there. He didn't ask them again, but he answered again. Jesus is giving the disciples uh, the answer while they're trying to figure it out. Oh, that's something uh, magnificent right there. You're trying to figure things out the hard way, and God has already answered your question the easy way. You're looking for an answer in a burning bush. You're looking for the answer in a storm. You're looking for answers in a lot of loud noise, but you see, God has already spoken in a still small voice. You need to slow down. You need to take your time. You need to settle down somewhere and see what God is saying. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, talking to the churches, he says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying. So I need you to go ahead and, and, and confirm it in your mind that while I'm looking for answers in all of the wrong places, God has already spoken to me. He answered again and said to them, children, he gets their attention. He says, children, pay attention. It's like a teacher in a classroom when, the, when, the, when there's a lot of noise and children are running everywhere. Y'all remember back when the children uh, were going to school and, and, and they were running, you know, I can imagine in my mind, children running everywhere, making a lot of noise. And, and for the teacher to get the attention, they would pound the desk and say, children, and the room would come into order. God, I have another point to teach you. God 
is calling you by name to get your attention. I don't know who I'm talking to on today, but, but you're in a, in, a, in a situation right now where you have to make the right decision for things to go the way that they are intended to go. And, and God has to get your attention. Listen for God calling your name. He says, children, how hard is it? And he changes something here that, that caught my attention. It grabbed my attention. It jumped from the pages. He said, children, how hard is it? For them that trust in riches. You see, in 23, he says, how holy shall they that have riches? And I've always told the saints here at Assembly Chapel, I don't, I don't preach uh, prosperity, but I don't preach poorness either. I don't believe that God wants us to struggle. I don't believe that God wants us to uh, suffer and experience lack. I believe that we serve a God who wants us to be wealthy. We serve a God who bless us richly in all things. We serve a God where the Bible says the blessings of the Lord make us rich and add no sorrow. So he says here in 24, there's one word that changes it. He said, how hard is them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. I need to tell you that that, that is good to have things. Don't, don't get me wrong. But it's not good to put your trust, your faith, and your hope in these things. The Bible teaches us, amen, paraphrasing scripture. The Bible teaches us not to put our hope and our trust in our earthly possessions because they'll, they'll rust and fade away. But it says put your affections on high. Put your trust on high. Put your, your, your rewards in the kingdom of God where they will not rust. They will not fade away. It's a good investment. Amen. If, if you place all of your possessions in God's hands. It's a great investment to place all of your possessions in heaven. So he says here that how hard is it for them that trust in riches. So I need to ask somebody that's watching on this morning, where do you put your trust? Amen. Where do you, do you put your hope? Who do you have your hope and your trust in? Some of you have your hope and your trust in your spouses. Some of you put your hope and your trust in the stock market and all of that as well. But you put your trust and your hope in the Lord's hand. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, or his seed begging bread. Because the righteous, we put our hope and our trust in the Lord. Now the problem is sometimes when you put your hope and your trust in the Lord, it doesn't feel right to your flesh and your mind can't understand it and it does not quite compute to you and you feel like you're losing when actually you're winning. You feel like there's more subtracting going on in your life than adding, but if you just hold on, like the old church used to say, if you just hold on a little while longer and see what the end is going to be. I'm, I'm almost done here. Give me about 20 more minutes. And and, the, and he says here, how long is it them that trust riches? It's easier. Here's what I want to take a little bit of time and work on and I'll set myself down. He says, it's easier. Mm -hmm. Y'all got a few more minutes. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, I've heard a lot of explanations on this scripture about what the camel, the eye of the needle may mean. Some of them made sense and some of them did not but what I want to focus on is the meaning and the illustration that God is giving to us in his scriptures the illustration that Jesus is using for his disciples because as he called them children when you're dealing with children you need to break things down to the most simple form Amen. And what Jesus is telling the disciples, because the disciples knew that the camel was the largest animal on Palestine sands. And he knew that the eye of a needle was the smallest of small openings. And Jesus is setting something up quite marvelous here as we conclude this Sunday morning's sermon. But he says here that 
for a rich man who trusts in his riches. Remember, one who trusts in their riches is easier for a large animal, a camel, to pass through a small opening, which is the eye of a needle. And 26 says that the disciples were even the more astonished. They were astonished beyond measure. Uh -huh. I think it's safe to say that the disciples' minds were blown. Uh -huh. and they said to themselves, well, who can be saved? And again, using my sanctified imagination, I believe there were emphasis on the word can. And I believe that the disciples were saying, well, who can be saved? Because just like we do on today, the disciples, uh, they thought that the more possessions you had, the more blessed that you were. And they aligned riches and possessions with closeness to God. And again, I can't understand the mindset of the disciples because they were with Jesus when he performed miracles. But here in the Bible that says, uh, well, who can be saved? I want everybody in their homes right now to pose that question because the Bible has an answer. I need somebody in your living rooms to ask the question, brother preacher, who can be saved? Uh -huh. And the Bible teaches me here in verse number 27, Jesus looked upon them and he says something here that is very profound. Uh, Jesus tells the disciples here that it doesn't matter who you are and it doesn't matter what you do. Uh, that, that, that there's some things that are not made possible with man's power. Uh, it doesn't matter what universities you matriculate through. Some things are not possible with man. Uh, it doesn't matter how many riches you accumulate in your, uh, in your life. There are still some things that money cannot buy. Right? So he answers the disciples here. He says, with men, it is impossible. Uh, just like it's impossible for a camel to travel through the eye of a needle. Uh, it is impossible for you to earn your way to the kingdom. Uh, and there's an answer in the Bible that I want to give you and I'll bid you a farewell. Uh, but the Bible says Jesus talking to his disciples. Uh, he says with men it is impossible. Uh, but after the comma there's a but. And every time there's a but there's a change, a paradigm shift in the, the scripture. Uh, and I'm so glad that there is a chance that I can obtain life everlasting. Uh, the Bible says with men it may be impossible. Uh, so I don't care who your business partner is here on this earth. Uh, I don't care who you get uh, mastermind theology with here on this earth. Uh, but, but I came to tell you that if God is not in the equation, uh, I need to tell somebody that if Jesus is not in the meeting room, uh, then you will not inherit eternal life. Uh, I don't know about you on this morning, but my goal is to inherit eternal life. Uh, and the Bible says, but with God. Uh, somebody in your living room shout, but with God. But with God, for with God all things are possible. Uh, and that's where I'm going to close my Bible because it makes me happy uh, to know that whatever mistakes that I made in my life, uh, it makes me happy uh, because I didn't dot every T across every I. Uh, it makes me happy uh, because I didn't treat people the way I needed to treat them all of the time. Uh, but it makes me happy uh, because one day I, I found God uh, and the Bible says uh, that with God uh, all things, uh, somebody shout all things, uh, all things uh, are possible. Uh, so with God, uh, I know uh, that I have a chance uh, with God, uh, I know uh, that I can make it uh, with God. Uh, I know uh, that there's life uh, and life more abundantly. Uh, is it anybody here? Uh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Uh, is it anybody here uh, ready uh, to approach Jesus uh, like a little child?
wonder what was going on. Maybe some preacher caught your ear while you were somewhere in the room, while your mothers and your fathers were listening to some preaching on the internet. I want to pray for you today. I want to pray salvation wherever you are. I want to pray for salvation in your homes. They may not even be there right now, but I want to pray salvation in your home. So let us pray, and I want to give a benediction. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would arrest evil in our homes. If there are any unsaved coming in and out of the doors of our homes. We pray, Heavenly Father, that they will see the light. We pray, Heavenly Father, that they would give their lives to you. We're here to win souls. Greater works than you did shall we do. We're here, Lord God, to direct people to you. You are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. And I believe that with my whole heart. If there's any out there that are unsaved, Lord God, I pray that they would turn from their wicked ways. I pray that they would give their lives to you right now, at this instant. Those out there that have backslidden, in a backslidden state, don't send them into a reprobate mind just yet, God. I pray that you give them another chance. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. Let us say amen. 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 Assembly Chapel, big hug. Big kiss. Pastor loves you. God bless you.